First Chronicles chapter 22. I hope this message will not come out the wrong way. Um, I pray that it'll be a blessing to you. To be honest, when I was writing the middle of this message, I wanted to change it, but um, I just went for it. So I think the Lord led this on my heart. Let's go to First Chronicles chapter 22. We'll go to verse 7. Now, King David, he's about to uh, pass away to go on with his forefathers, but he wanted to give final instructions to Solomon before he passed away. If I was in David's shoe, where I'm at the last moments of my life, and if you were to think about being in David's shoe, when you're about to pass away, there's something that you want to leave behind. And there are some things in your life that you feel like you are not able to do, but you're hoping that the other person that you talk to before you die will be able to take that with them and fulfill and live the life that you weren't able to do. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever met loved ones before they passed away? You kind of got that impression from them. Picture yourself as a person who is dying on his or her bed and imagine some things that you feel like have been missing in your life that you wish you could have done, but it wasn't just possible. So you're hoping that the person you talk to could live it out for you. Look at verse 7. And David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build an house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest. And I will give him rest from all his enemies round about. For his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. He shall build an house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now, my son, the Lord be with thee, and prosper thou, and build the house of the Lord thy God, as he has said of thee. Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding." and give thee charge concerning Israel, that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. Then shalt thou prosper, if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage, dread not, nor be dismayed. Now behold, in my trouble I have prepared for the house of the Lord an hundred thousand talents of gold and a thousand thousand talents of silver and a brass and iron without weight, for it is in abundance. Timber also and stone have I prepared, and thou mayest add thereon, uh, thereto. Moreover, there are workmen with thee in abundance, hewers and workers of stone and timber, and all manner of cunning men for every manner of work. Will you pray with me? Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit as I preach your word, and I pray that I'll be filled with Holy Ghost unction on high, doesn't have to be from fleshly might, Father. You've proven that to me over and over again. I pray that this church will not rely on fleshly might for the sermon to convict them, for them to lose their shout and their spirit, their joy in you. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the sermon will reach out, that you will truly be present in here and that the people can see that. And you'll be honored and glorified. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. The title of my message, believe it or not, is actually my plea to you. If there is a wish that I want to be fulfilled, it would be based on this title. Enjoy the life I cannot have. I want you to go to verse 7. Verse 7. And David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great wars. 
Thou shalt not build an house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. My first point, my first point is enjoy the sacrificed life. Enjoy the sacrificed life. Now, when we first read this passage, it sounds pretty negative. It sounds like a bad thing that, David, you have a lot of blood on your hands. Because of that, you cannot build the temple for me. Now, if you are in David's shoes, that's pretty unfair to say, God. David, he had such a strong desire to build the most magnificent temple that he can ever build for God. I mean, he was waiting for this day. When you read the rest of the passage, he prepared heavily for that day. When he became king, he never wanted to build anything glorious for himself. All he wanted to do was for God and God alone, just build him the grandest, the greatest house. And God just suddenly, can you imagine how his spirit is totally discouraged when God says, you cannot do it because you shed much blood. I mean, being David, can you imagine where your mind is stirring and thinking, God, it's not like I wanted to shed blood. I know I conquered a lot of enemies. I know I killed a lot of them. But Father God, I had to defend my country. Solomon, he never knew what war was. Solomon, his son, never did war. So God said, I'm going to choose him to build my temple. That ain't fair to David. David had to shed much blood. He had to do a lot of sacrificing. He had to kill down a lot of enemies and hindrances so that his country can be protected and his kingdom can prosper. I mean, the one who's doing all the hard work, he should get the credit. He should get the task to build the temple, not Solomon. So that's pretty unfair to say. But it's not a bad thing when David said, I shed much blood because of that, I cannot build the temple. It's not a bad statement that David's pointing out. When you keep reading the passage, David is pointing out, I can't build the temple due to shedding much blood based on this. When we look at verse, when we look at verse 18, is not the Lord your God with you? And hath he not given you rest on every side? For he hath given the inhabitants of the land into mine hand. See, David is saying, I shed much blood. I subdued every enemy in this land so that I can give you rest. So I can give you the chance, ample opportunity to build the temple, to enjoy the fruits of my sacrifice, of the blood that I heavily shed. Verse 19, now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord God. Arise, therefore, and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God. Solomon was able to enjoy the fruits of David's conquest, the blood that David heavily shed, the sweat, the effort. Can you imagine stress after stress, strain after strain, labor after labor to conquer this enemy and that enemy? Make sure they get cleared out. I got to establish my kingdom. Make sure nothing interferes. I got to make it clean. I got to make it perfect and easy setting where it's all ready for my son to build the greatest, grandest temple ever. Amen. That's the blood, how much blood and sacrifice David had to shed, but he can't live that life. And he understood that. He did that all just for Solomon's sake, so that Solomon could enjoy the fruits of David's labor where he is not able to do it. A lot of members do not realize this same thing, that everything that you have in this church is done because of a leader's labor and shedding much blood. A lot of blood was shed. A lot of enemies and evil spirits and hindrances were killed to build up this kind of a church for you. You don't realize that there was much blood shed for you to sit on the very seat that you are able to sit comfortably in 
to hear the word of God spoken to you in this kind of a wonderful place that we would think is impossible. But impossibilities had to be fought. Impossibilities had to be conquered. Blood had to be shed so that you can get something like this. The simple question that you have to ask yourself if you find this hard to believe is, what would happen if I would just quit now? Think about it. If I were to stop everything right now, what would happen after this? Would you be able to keep enjoying the fruits here or will you be the one to have to shed blood, to sacrifice, to keep this ministry going? Is this making some sense here? You have to picture that. Picture me out of this ministry. If you think what you're doing helping out the pastor is sacrifice enough, think of me out of the way completely. Think of me not following up. Think of me just have nothing to do with it. Not there to counsel, encourage you if you have questions. Think of it if, as you started from scratch at the age of 21 in the Bay Area with no guide and counselor there with you and then have to build something like this. This is something very serious to think about, you have to realize. Because things like this can happen. I'm not saying that I'm going away, but you have to realize there will be times in your life that there has to be shedding of much blood or whatever you're able to enjoy. It, do, it goes on borrowed time. The things you're able to enjoy goes by borrowed time because as long as somebody is doing the sacrificing or there was a lot of bloodshed at the beginning, you can enjoy what you have today. Here's another thing to think about. Let's assume you do sacrifice a lot to provide the fruits to the people here to keep this church running. You as a leader, think about this, would you be able to enjoy the fruits with your members if you're the one to, doing the sacrificing? To be honest, think about it, be serious. If you were to take this position here, if you were to take this position here, there are fruits you cannot enjoy with the members here. There are sacrifices you have to do. An easy example is revival meetings. Now, we love that, right? Uh, I love it too. I mean, the blowout is such a fun time. But you have to realize that the leader is the one who has to have it constantly in his mind where everybody is doing their task properly, where the leader is too busy talking to a million people and hosting people, and then the pastors making sure everybody is able to come, their needs are attended. The pastor has to be the one to check up everything, and if something goes wrong in the blowout, it doesn't fall on the member, it falls on the leader. So then he has this kind of pressure on everything. So he's not able to be like the member to just come in and glean in and enjoy the preaching and glean in and enjoy the fellowship for many hours. Do you understand that? See, there are some things, if you were to take the position of the leader, you have to make sacrifices so that the people can enjoy the fruits Amen. of a blowout meeting. Think about teaching and preaching. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing better to preach and to teach the Word of God. But when you're doing this for 13 years, I mean, you just want to be the one to be preached at. You want to be the one to sit down and write notes and to be taught. I mean, you just crave for that. Can you imagine living years of your life without preaching and teaching? And you have to be the one doing that to the people. And then you have to push yourself. You have to make sure you're spiritually checked in without preaching and teaching while you give the preaching and teaching to them. You talk about draining your spiritual energy and sometimes feeling like a hypocrite because you have to be the one spiritually in check. You have to spiritually motivate yourself, whereas the people don't really have to do that because they can be the recipient instead. They can listen to the teaching and preaching to receive the motivation. 
See, they cannot, they get to glean the fruit, whereas certain leaders can't. Does this make sense? We don't realize the importance of what we have now and what sacrifices had to be made so that we can enjoy the fruits that we have. What's the point that I'm saying? You can live the lives of fruits that certain leaders or pastors cannot have. The life that pastors or leaders desired, always desired to have. When can I be the person sitting down hearing the preaching and teaching? When can I be the one to actually go on the altar and be able to have that experience to get right with God? When can I be the one to be able to just enjoy fellowship during a revival meeting and not think about anything going wrong? And if something does go wrong, I can just simply overlook it and encourage uh, the pastor and the people that it's a good meeting. When can I be that person? When can I be that guy to be able to be the recipient? It's a life that certain pastors and leaders can never have. It's a life they have to shed blood, right. shed much blood. Why? So that you can live the life that I can never have. So my plea is, enjoy the fruits with the blood that was shed so much Please enjoy that life that I can never have myself. My second point is enjoy the special life. Enjoy the special life. Look at chapter 22, verse 9. Chapter 22, verse 9. Solomon, he's a very special son. He has a life that is very special, believe it or not, that is different from David's. It's so special that God chose Solomon, not David, not Solomon's leader, not Solomon's king. Out of all the people, God should have chose David, but God chose Solomon because God saw something Solomon as his life being more special than his leader, David. If you look at verse 9, Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon." And I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Can you picture yourself being Solomon, hearing all that? You would say, no, that ain't me. <laughs> no, that don't fit me. You got the wrong person. You're putting me on a high pedestal. I don't think I'm that special. Really, pastor, there's something that God sees in me that's more special than you. I find that hard to believe. If you were Solomon in charge of this huge kingdom, hearing about David's conquests, how he defeated Goliath, how he was able to conquer nation after nation, even his own people where uh, nearly all the tribes were against him, and yet he was the one who was able to win against all of them. I mean, hearing all of that, would Solomon be confident and say, yep, that's right, I'm more special than David? No, he feels incompatible. He feels maybe even that David is more spiritual than him. And later on, we see in the Bible, it is actually true, David was more spiritual than Solomon. And I'm sure you feel the same way too if God were to tell you, your life is so special that is above the pastor here, that is above the leader here that I can use for my glory. You might say, no, I cannot believe that one. Well, uh, let's examine this text. The first one is in verse 9. It says, verse 9, Behold, a son shall be born to thee. Skip down a bit, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about. Skip down a bit, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. God gave Solomon certain blessings that King David was not able to have himself. Rest from his enemies, prosperity in his life. And that's the thing you have to understand yourself. You have certain blessings, Solomon, that David does not have himself. You might say, really, I have certain blessings. Yes, for example, you have resources to minister to your needs. 
I mean, think about the unlimited resources. If you need a track on a certain subject, all you have to do is go to that track rack. All you have to do is simply ask one of the brethren, and they'll help you out. You need a resource where uh, even those who are watching online with the excuse, I don't have a Bible-believing church, you got this channel that meets all sorts of subjects and issues. And if you have a problem or a question, you could just email Albeit we take a little while because we're, I'm only one man, but we do get back to you. We do get back to you. Unless you're Lulu, then we don't get back to you, all right? And there are Lulus online. But the point is we have all sorts of resources that minister to every need. Every month we have something special where we can enjoy fellowship, a fun time. Twice to thrice a week, some of you more than that, five times a week, you get something spiritual to feed you. I mean, what are the blessings of that? But a pastor is not able to partake in those things a lot of times. As a matter of fact, the pastor, a lot of time with certain resources, he would have to be the one that would provide the resource. He would have to be the one to research and find the resource for you. He would have to be the one. There are certain blessings you can enjoy that the pastor doesn't have. You have certain ministries and discipleships that meet your age level, that meet uh, your, uh, that either for men or female or whatever demographic that you have, it ministers to you. But the pastor, he's not able to partake in those things because he has to be the leader, unfortunately. He has to be the leader and make sure that they're running, not be the recipient to those blessings. See, it's important that if you have so much of this, enjoy the life that I cannot have. I did not have resources like this, you have to understand, even when I was young, even when I was attending other churches. This is something you want to take full advantage of. Yeah. yeah that other people is not able to have. Being trained, being disciple, learning how to soul win, what a huge blessing. Amen. I cannot receive training. I have to be the trainer. What a blessing to just be with brothers and sisters in Christ, write notes, practice on each other. Learning doctrine, learning how to deal with problems and situations. It's, it's a blessing. It's not a chore. It's not a work. It's not something to take lightly. This is something you have that I wish you would not waste time on, on. waste weeks and months skipping on, that I cannot have, that I cannot have. A second thing in verse 9 is, notice it says, who shall be a man of rest, for his name shall be Solomon. Because of who Solomon is, he's a man of rest. His very name itself means man of peace. Solomon, because of who he is, he gets a break from war. He gets a break from certain bad times. Because of who you are, you're not a leader, you're not a pastor, you get a break from certain things. You have to realize that some, when you come to pastor for counseling, that's something you can take full advantage of to enjoy, but the pastor, can he do that with the member? You might offer it to me, but one thing I learned from other pastors, that's a huge no-no. Why? You see me as this. Because you see me as this, if my weaknesses are exposed, then later on in life, you're going to try to catch these patterns and you can't trust me as your leader. But see, you're, because of who you are, you're not a leader or a pastor. You can come to counsel. You think pastor is going to look down on you on something? He knows who he is and who you are, see? It's just a member, a sheep who's broken, hurting. You take full advantage of it. Why is there shame on that one? Do you know how badly I want that? You don't understand that. How badly I want that. There are times that I couldn't even get counsel from other pastors, if that makes sense to you. And only a pastor would understand that. You can't give everything and get counsel, everything from other pastors when you become a pastor. There are things that God has to do. No, this is between you and me. You have to grow up. You have to understand that's something I always yearned and craved for, and it was not fair to me. 
I wanted that so badly. You can offer it to me, but I've learned my lesson from the Lord. I cannot. I cannot. But you can. You can. Enjoy that life that I cannot have. You don't have to worry about certain church duties or schedule because mainly the one who has to worry about it the most is a pastor. If there are certain duties that are neglected, forgotten, scheduled, that is out of sync, the responsibility ultimately is not you, but on the pastor. That's why he has to follow up. He has to write it down. He has to constantly have it in his mind because of who you are, see? You just want to help. That's it. You're not the one who uh, is in charge of everything and where the ultimate accountability dumps upon. You're learning that, some of it right now. You're getting a taste of that right now. But there are things that you can still get away. But to the pastor, he has to pay the price. See, you are able to get a break that certain leaders and pastors do not have. You get a break where you don't have to follow up on people or rebuke people or set things in order. If, if you don't think that's a break, then I'd gladly switch positions with you. I'd like to see how you straighten out a member. I'd like to see you... I'd straighten out a member where they don't get discouraged and they don't come back anymore and you can keep them in church. All right? See, this is not fun, following up on people, trying to rebuke if I have to. Find a certain level. Because of who you are, you don't have to do that with people. So enjoy. Enjoy that while you can. Here's a big thing. Losing testimony. You can lose your testimony here and there and then you'll be able to still come back. But it only takes, in my case, and it's game over. Am I perfect? No. Some people notice my imperfections, but those imperfections costed a huge price that I have to make up for. If I did a major one, then it's over for me. See, enjoy the life that I cannot have. Why get discouraged, see? Why get discouraged? This is not something to be discouraged about in your case. There are so many fruits you can take advantage of. Another thing at verse 10 is, He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father. Here's another thing. You have the ability to do things that the leader or the pastor cannot do. Now, that's inconceivable, I know. You might think, no, pastor has so many abilities. No way I can do that. No, you have, you're so special that you have abilities that I cannot do. You have talents that I don't have. I always desired to play the piano. You know that? Always desired to play an instrument. But you have it where I don't have it. And take full advantage of that. Some of you have certain talents that I don't have. What is it that you have that I don't have? Maybe you're good at talking to people more. Maybe the job and the occupation you're doing, you can help out this church. I know zero about construction. Do you know how heavily this church relies on construction? On just manual labor that you belittle? Even plumbing, even roofing. How heavily we rely on those people. Talents that I wish I always had. And I've seen pastors who had these talents and they're able to build better churches, but I can't. You have it that I don't have. There's something in your job. What is your hobby? What is your job you're good at? Why don't you take full advantage of that? Whereas I can't. There are tasks that you volunteer for that the pastor cannot do. You know why? Because he's the leader. That's who he is. He's a pastor. So he can't be the one all the time cleaning toilets, even though sometimes you'll see me here and there trying to. But why? I'm the leader. I'm the pastor. Those days to, not belittling, those days that I covet to clean the toilets, if you would believe yeah. that. <laughs> to clean the pews. Amen. Those days before I was a pastor, just volunteering for anything, and being with brothers and sisters doing that, right. not all alone with the pressure and you have to do something between you and God. You relate to members on certain tasks, in fellowship, and even the mistakes you make, you relate to them better 
than the pastor. Why? Because if I try to relate to the person in a task, encourage them to do it. In a mistake they made and try to encourage them. In fellowship with them, it's not the same. Because I am the pastor. But you, they see you as he or she is like me. That's encouraging. If they can so when I can so when too. If they made that mistake and they can get over it, I can do that too. Oh, the life that you, that you have that I do not have, I wish you would enjoy a little bit more. The last part of verse 10 says, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. You can even enjoy certain periods of time that I can't live in. Does that mean that... Uh, I'm going to get old and die out and you enjoy it where I can't? No, but there are certain periods of time. I cannot be in long fellowships. Why? Because the long fellowship brings that closeness when pastors are supposed to put boundaries. You won't understand that until you become a leader or a pastor yourself. But that closeness becomes very dangerous where more vulnerability exposes itself and people will see it. I cannot be in long fellowships. I have to leave earlier. I have to turn down the offers. Oh, where I would go back home and say, oh, if I were those brothers and sisters where I can just fellowship till midnight like before. Those days, those days, why can't you enjoy it more? When I was a kid, I would be the one who was alone in the ministry and didn't have teachers really or resources really that would meet my age, my demographic. I was a pastor's son and my dad started from scratch. Here, we're, you're getting them now. Kids, you can live the years in a ministry where I can't. I didn't have that many uh, fun and games either. You get to live the years that I can't. Would you take full advantage of that? I'm not a woman, so I can't get woman's Bible study. <laughs> Sisters, to take advantage of it every Thursday evening. Amen. That meets your demographic. What a blessing. I cannot have that. Certain periods of time that I can't be in is a peaceful life, a fruitful life. There are times I get fruits, don't get me wrong, and I'm gleaning them. But that's not my, the majority of my life. Majority was shedding blood. Majority was at the foundation's pain and sacrifice. A lot of you here didn't have to go through that. A lot of you don't have to live those periods of time. A lot of you can just live in the fruitful years. Yeah where there is revival, where there is shouting, where souls are getting constantly saved, where there is brethren spiritually growing. You get to live those years. Live those years where I can enjoy the life that I cannot have. You don't have to shed blood when somebody did it for you. The third point is enjoy the successful life. Enjoy the successful life. When we look at verse 11, the Bible says, Now, my son, the Lord be with thee, and prosper thou and build the house of the Lord thy God, as he has said of thee. If you keep your hand here, go to chapter 28. <laughs> chapter 28, and then we'll look at verse 5 through 6. Verses 5 through 6. David instructs Solomon that God has chosen him to build this grand and glorious temple. When you hear that, that's like, that's a lot of work. Whew. That's a lot of pressure. Whew. You sure you want to dump all that on me? I'm too young. Look at verse 5. And of all my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons, he hath chosen Solomon my son to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And he said unto me, Solomon thy son, he shall build my house and my courts. When, when Solomon first hears that, you can imagine, it's scary. It's a scary thing to take on a huge task like that, especially at his age. It's not really encouraging. You're going to build the best temple in the world. And then in his mind, so you better do a good job at it. <laughs> but 
even though you're not as talented as David, you better start working on it. That's a lot of pressure on his part. But if one were not to see so much of the work, the pressure part, the same person would have recognized that when God told him that I chose you to build the temple, they would have recognized that at that statement, it wasn't God giving him work. It was more so a chance to enjoy prosperity. If you look at the main text again, chapter 22, verse 11, notice the first word he said. It wasn't work. It wasn't get under pressure. You better do a good job. It wasn't anything like that. In verse 11, now my son, the Lord be with thee and what? Prosper thou and build the house of the Lord. When he told him to build the house of the Lord, it wasn't, hey, you better do a good job and there's a lot of pressure on your hands and you're gonna, it's going to take a lot of work. You're going to have to work very hard. No, it was more so when you build the house, he was telling him to prosper, to enjoy the fruits, to live the life of success that David prepared for him. When you first hear about something that you should do in church, the first thing in our minds quite constantly is we see it as much work. We see it as something scary. We see it as something as a lot of pressure, so I better do a good job in this. That's why it, uh, when we come to the things of church, it turns off a lot of people. They don't want to get involved in discipleship, training, uh, have a chance to preach or teach or join soul winning or fellowships and stuff like that because they see that as a lot of work. Even coming to church itself, they pressure themselves and see that as a lot of work when in reality, it's not so. David shed much blood not so that you can work to get to church, so that you can finally enjoy a good church meeting. It's prosperity. It's to live successfully. It's not to work. It's not to get under pressure. But you know why we see this so much in church as work rather than prosperity? Do you know why you see the world as prosperity and enjoyment rather than church? The simple answer is you spend very little time in church and you spend most of your time with the worldly life. Worldly home, worldly work, worldly school, worldly peers around you. Very little time with brethren, very little time in church. And because of that, you are able, think about this, if you spend 10 hours or 12 hours or 20 something hours in a whole day living life in the world, you'll see glimpses and moments in the world to enjoy. And then when you add it all up together, because you're so used to living life in the world, you think there's that much enjoyment in the world. But picture if you spent that much time in church, see that? If you spent that many hours in church, you see these little glimpses of enjoyment. And if you spend that much little time in the world, wouldn't you see there's this much to enjoy in church too? Amen. See, that's the reason why. Good. More time in the world makes you see more things to enjoy in the world. You need to switch it around. More time in church makes you see more things to enjoy in church. But just these little moments here and there, you're not going to see it. And that's why... You can't enjoy the life. You can't enjoy the life that the pastor, the leader has sacrificed to give out to you. You can't live it. All they want you to do, all I want you to do is just to live it. It's not working. It's not to get stressed or pressure. Far be it. I just want you to enjoy. Finally enjoy the fellowship that worked so many years to build. Enjoy the church service that took so many years to build. Enjoy the ministries that took so many years to build. Enjoy the, even the fill-ins, the fill-in speakers here, our own members here. Enjoy them that took so many years to build. Enjoy the life that I cannot have. My fourth point is enjoy the sustained life. 
enjoy the sustained life. If, uh, I talked about previously enjoying the successful life. Now let's look at verse 12. Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding, and give thee charge concerning Israel, that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. And thou shalt prosper if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage, dread not, nor be dismayed. Now, what I'm going to say, uh, it might not apply to you, but there might be someone here that what I'm about to say will apply to that person and would want to hear this. Perhaps the reason why you don't take advantage of the blessings and the fruits here that was sacrificed for you is not because of disinterest. Maybe it's not because of disinterest or disbelief, but more, but more so of fear. It's probably you're afraid because with all this great blessing on you, you're afraid once you partake in it, you might be the one to mess it all up. You might be that one that I don't want to be that one when I come to church when everyone's fired up, when everyone's having a good time, that I'm the stumbling block. Come on, I'm the one that ruins the meeting, so I'm not going to come back to church. Come on, keep that. There's probably no one in here that has that, but maybe I'm speaking to one of you or somebody here that has that. You know what? You shouldn't be afraid. You know why? God said right here at verse 11 and 13, he said, verse 13, dread not, nor be dismayed. Why? Because just follow what I tell you to do. Just follow the best way you can that I tell you to do. He also said this, when you're trying to follow the best that you can on what I tell you to do, isn't it interesting that God said right here in verse 12, only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding. See, when you're trying to follow God's way, it's Him that's giving it to you, not yourself. Why do you depend on your works? You see over here as well, at verse 12, it says, The Lord thy God. You see right here in verse 13, The Lord charged Moses. And the last part of verse 13 Dread not, nor be dismayed. It's only God's works you depend on, not yours. When you have all this blessing, this fruits that's on your shoulder, don't be afraid of messing it all up because it's all on God, not on you. Amen. You just try the best that you can. Now, I know we all sin, and I know that we all make mistakes, but you have to understand that God promised that he would sustain Solomon and likewise he would sustain you even during the weaknesses. During the weaknesses that you have, how many mistakes have you made, sins that you've committed, but God has kept holding you up so that you can continue enjoying the prosperity and the fruits in this church. You are not disqualified from enjoying this. Do you understand? You are not considered unworthy to partake in this. Do you understand? This is something that God promised to give to you. Just try the best that you can. And when you fall, pick yourself back up because you're not the one picking yourself back up. It's God that's sustaining you and keeping you up. He'll keep you up. He'll take care of your mistakes. I mean, isn't this encouraging that David, who's probably a greater leader than Solomon, that he made serious mistakes too? He committed adultery and murder. But look how God sustained his life and put him on such a high pedestal that Solomon even feared to take. Isn't that amazing? If God can bless David, that much with his serious mistakes that he made and sustained him. Why can't God sustain you? Enjoy the prosperity, the fruits while you can. I mean, didn't you also know that Solomon's wisdom surpassed his own leader's wisdom? That's something that you can never picture a thousand years, but only God can do that. Only God can sustain him with that. What did God tell Solomon? I'll give you a wisdom discernment above all other kings that were before you and even after you. 
I mean, God sustains Solomon that much. What makes you think you're incompatible, you're unqualified to glean the blessings from this church and think that you're unworthy and you don't come anymore? You don't take up certain tasks in this church and try something for the Lord. What makes you think you're so unworthy to do that? You don't believe in your God that much that he could sustain you and make your wisdom maybe even one day surpass the leaders? That's something. That's only God and not you. That's only God and not you. And if you were to think only God and not yourself, if you were to look at God's sustenance rather than your mistakes, if you stop seeing how important your mistakes are above God's sustenance, then maybe you can do something with your life. Enjoy the life. Enjoy. So enjoy the life that I won't be able to have. My last point is enjoy the set life. Enjoy the set life. You know, everything is set out and laid out for you. If someone won a lottery, assuming a billion dollars, okay? I know, hypothetically. Ooh, that's huge, right? And said, hey, uh, here's the one billion dollar lottery that I won. I'm going to give it to you. Now, I know what you and I are going to do, all right? You and I are going to go, oh, thank you so much. You, know? <laughs> you and I would take that. You and I would grab that. Wouldn't you be so thrilled and enjoy every ounce of it as much as you can? Now, let me ask it in this way. What if somebody went through great trouble in working very long hours to give you the $1 billion? That would be a lot more serious than what? You would take that and, man, you would take it seriously and enjoy every moment of it. You won't waste it. You take it with much gratitude. But let me ask it in this way. What if it took many historical time periods? What if somewhere at the BCs, somebody worked long and hard to build up something where the next generation could own and enjoy it? And then after that person died out, the next person took over and worked hard and saved up to build up a net worth, a rich and richness and prosperity that the next generation can enjoy. And then the next generation did that through the time of the Grecians to the time of Rome and the fall of Rome throughout the Dark Ages and throughout the time of the prosperity of America. Let's say it just went on and on and on and on up to the year 2023. And they saved up $1 billion net worth for you to enjoy. Now, what would you think after that? I'm not going to waste this. I'd be the biggest fool in history to waste this, to not take advantage of. You know, didn't you know Solomon was that one? Look at chapter 22, verse 14. Chapter 22, verse 14. Now behold, in my trouble. He went through great trouble. I have prepared for the house of the Lord an hundred thousand talents of gold. Verse 15, moreover, there are workmen with thee in abundance. So David and many people went through great trouble to give this $100 billion net worth for Solomon when you calculate his temple and his riches. You know how big this was? All the way to the almost the beginnings of the Old Testament. Look at chapter 24. The Bible lays it out for you. Look at every historical time period and person and worker that was laid out for Solomon just for that day, just for Solomon. Look at chapter 24. Now, verse 1. Now, these are the divisions of the sons of who? Aaron. Aaron. So here is the priesthood from the beginning of Aaron laid out already for Solomon. Look at chapter 25. Chapter 25. Notice that David and the captain of the host took all the musicians. The musicians from the book of Psalm, you have to realize. Musicians from the beginning of time. They prepared all of them. Look at chapter 26. Chapter 26. Concerning the divisions of the porters, of the Korhites was Meshelemiah, the son of Korah, of the sons of Asaph. Go back and back and back. And then verse 28, notice right here, 28. 
And all that Samuel the seer and Saul the son of Kish and Abner the son of Ner and Joab the son of Zariah had dedicated. Wow. It goes all the way back to the beginning of Kings. That was laid out for Solomon. Wow. Look at chapter 27. Now, verse 1, Now the children of Israel, after their number to wit, the chief fathers and captains of thousands and hundreds and their officers that served the king in any manner of the courses. Verse 2, Over the first course for the first month with Jashobeam, the son of Zabdil, and his course uh, were twenty and four thousand. Go on and on and on. It goes all the way back to what? Verse 16, Furthermore, over the tribes of Israel. It goes all the way to the beginning of the 12 tribes of Israel. Do you understand that? To Genesis. To Genesis, all of that was laid out in preparation for Solomon. For Solomon to glean and to enjoy. He would be the greatest fool in history where Jacob was waiting for a prosperous life like that, where Moses and the Levites wandered in the wilderness to lay this out, where David had to shed much blood, where Saul started out as king. I mean, he would be the greatest fool in history to turn down over $100 billion net worth and make it the most prosperous kingdom ever. He would be the greatest fool, and he was. He was. Because... He sinned with his wives and he split and ruined that nation that took centuries to build. Wow. Centuries. Solomon started the split and the downfall of everything in Israel. You know why Israel don't have Solomon's days? Because of Solomon. That idiot. The greatest fool in history. The greatest Fool in history in spite of so much wisdom. Isn't that amazing? But, you know, your leader and many Christian forefathers took great trouble through centuries, centuries, where the apostles and early Christians bled and died being torn apart by lions. While the engines have to memorize verses to lay out manuscripts for your King James Bible. The Great Awakening revivals and missionaries where they had to go to foreign countries being all alone so that people in those nations could hear the gospel. Where the Great Awakening revivals and the people had to lay it out. All of this and foundation with foundation of people who studied where you don't have to study. Dispensational doctrine from Schofield to Ruckman. And here you are more than... Do you realize more than $100 billion net worth that you have? You would be the greatest fool in history to waste something like this. What you have is greater than Solomon's temple. The temple you have is greater than Solomon's temple. Do you understand? For Jesus, who is God, gave up his holiness and died on the cross, left everything to live in your heart. This is more than a hundred billion dollars net worth. This is impossibility that would change history, if not alternate, the universe itself. This is something you and I have. You'd be the greatest fool to turn all that down. You know what Solomon should have done from the beginnings? He should have not gotten involved with those hindrances at the beginning. Yeah. With those sins, with those wives at the beginning. Problem solved. He didn't. Have, so, what's hindering you from enjoying? What are your wives? What are your sins that's hindering you from enjoying more than a hundred billion dollar net worth? That's not worth it compared to what centuries was built up for you. Do you understand? It took millennia to build up what you have today. This is not, any hindrance in the world is not worth that, Solomon. Your wife, your sin, is not worth that, Solomon. Solomon, I mean, it's not worth that. You should not have gotten involved from the beginning. If you still are, then get rid of them now. Get rid of them now so that you can enjoy. If you can't, because God has put you at a point where nothing can be done about it, 
then pray to make more time and effort to enjoy the fruits. Don't let hindrance steal you a hundred billion dollars net worth. Don't be the greatest fool. When we look at verse 14, David never said that he and all these people who set up the blessings for Solomon to, en to enjoy was done in gladness, was done in happiness. David never said that. He said when all this pre was prepared, it was done at verse 14, when we go back to chapter 22, and verse 14, now behold in my trouble. He did it in trouble, not in happiness or in gladness. As a matter of fact, didn't you know in Psalm, if David is the writer of uh, most of it, if not all, that if David was that writer, he mentioned trouble 55 times and cry 55 times, while happiness is only 41 times and joy only 34 times. Why? He built all this in trouble so that it was a life of trouble that Solomon didn't have to have. The life that Solomon could have is peace and joy that David wouldn't have. You know, you have to understand that this is all done in trouble. And that your leaders and Christian forefathers before, it was done in trouble. And with all this that was laid out in trouble, they did it so that you don't have to shed blood. They did it so you don't have to go through the strenuous pains. So that you don't have to go with patience with people who are broken and help, and help build them up. So that you don't have to go through these years of stress and pain and sweat. This is laid out so that you don't have to get the trouble that I have. I'll live it for you. You can get the joy that I won't have. And you can live that one for me. You know, when I read about the civil wars and the uh, World War I, II, Vietnam War, and, uh, and all the other war stories... How soldiers communicated with family before telephone came to the scene or cell phones. It was done in writing letters. As they were writing letters, the soldiers went through hell. A lot of shedding of blood and sacrifice and pain after pain. But what kept them happy was when they read that letter from their family. And they see that their spouse and their children and their loved ones are enjoying the freedom that those soldiers would probably never have. The peace that the soldiers would probably never go back to. Hearing about the welfare of the kids and then their loved ones, how they're enjoying this, enjoying that in life. That keeps them happy in the middle of hell and war. It's what kept them going. They were happy as long as their families were enjoying the peace and freedom that they were fighting for. If you want to make me happy, this, was, this is what will encourage your pastor so much. It'll help me fight harder in war for you. It'll help me go endure and grip my teeth through hell for you is when I remember every time some church member enjoys life in Jesus Christ, is thankful Amen. for this church, how they're heavily involved in this. And when I look at that, I tell myself, how can I give up fighting after that? How can I stop fighting after that? This is what keeps me going, even online. It's even the point where I'm traveling to churches. It's so many people saying, thank you. So many people saying, I found a Bible-believing church because of this. I got saved because of this. This is, my, this is what keeps me happy. Like Paul said, you are my letter, my epistle. Each and every one of you is my letter that I communicate with a family that I care so much. If I can see you live the peace and the freedom that I have to fight for, that I cannot have and maybe never have, it will keep me going. 
So my plea to you, what I'm begging you all my life and being, is please enjoy the life that I can never have. Thank you, Pastor. Every head bow and every eye shut.